What up, party people? Your boy BQ in the place to be. Welcome back to the negative, the most negative channel ever. This is your Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review. Uh, headlined by Tasha Steeles versus Jordan Grace in the main event. Another very, very good show. They've uh, they've strung a couple really excellent shows together, so uh, that makes me very happy. Uh, makes it a lot easier for me to watch, a lot easier for me to cover when the episodes are good. We are almost at 7,000 subscribers. We're just a couple away, so um, if it is your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button. Maybe give it a thumbs up. And of course, leave your thoughts in the comments about this past episode. For you first-timers, I am BQ, the most negative, and uh, I am not a Mark podcaster. If something is good, I'm 100% going to tell you if it's good. If it is not good, I'm going to tell you that it's not good. And there's a lot of fans out there, wrestling fans, who just cannot handle anything other than that the the show that they watch the promotion that they support is just the most amazing thing in the world you know um this is my favorite company this is what i enjoy watching this is the company that has not turned me away you know there was a there was a period a, a little bit post pandemic uh, i guess it was still during the pandemic but uh where i i was close but this company has not pushed me away where everyone else has at some point you know, so uh, this is the company that I support the most, even when I sound like that I'm not. And um, I've been joking lately on Twitter that my podcasting heroes are Vince Russo, Eric Bischoff, uh, Jim Cornette. And I know they're very like controversial figures, and I don't agree with every single thing they say, just like I don't expect people to agree with everything that I say. Uh, but I do look at these guys as um, it, as far as their lane and their area of expertise and what they did well and what their role was in wrestling, there hasn't been anyone better in their positions. Like you can talk about Vince Russo booking all you all you want, but if you know anything about success, you know that for every good idea, you've got 20 bad ones. You throw shit at the wall, see what sticks. Um, but no one creatively has ever booked a more popular wrestling show than when Vince Russo was around. No one has ever competed with WWE. No executive level um, individual has has had the success that Eric Bischoff has. You know, so um, the reason I, I really get into them is that you know you listen to Vince Russo and he gives you a lot of knowledge on the creative side of things. Uh, Eric Bischoff does from a, like a business standpoint and, and formatting television and, you know, and then Jim Cornette is very good with, with finding logic holes and uh, whether it's creatively or whether it's in the match itself, you know, like he, he is able to break down the matches really well. And, and um, you know, people don't like these guys, but that is kind of where, that is just where I get my, I don't want to call it my knowledge of wrestling, but just my view of the way I look at wrestling. I kind of get it from, from dudes like that rather than, you know, Denise Salcedo or what, you know, that thinks everything is good, no matter what company she's watching. And, you know, some of these other podcasters and, and YouTube personalities, which I'm not saying they're not good people, but if you just sit here and say, Hey, everything that I'm watching is the, is the fucking bees knees, then, you know, you're a fanatic and being a fanatic is is a sickness. So uh, we're going to get into this episode here. One time for your mind. It kicks off with explosion. It doesn't kick off. with. I mean, I imagine it kicked off with explosion, right? But I'm going to get in. I'm going to kick it off with explosion. That's what I meant to say. I didn't watch this show. I've watched a couple episodes of explosion, but they have gotten to the point where it is now um, the old explosion. Or it's basically like BTI. They changed the approach at first. We got a couple matches, and that's what the fan base has been asking for for a while. They wanted uh, multiple. They wanted uh, multiple matches, and TNA had had experimented a little bit, you know, with with tying BTI into the 
impact episode and trying to get people to watch BTI and or recapping BTI on the show. The uh, the original uh, ex- uh, uh, format for Explosion. Well, the the reason the original Explosion was just done for the overseas markets. Like it was never done for the fans in the U.S., which I don't think is something that a lot of the fans here have were able to grasp. <laughs> you know, but a lot of fans have always wanted a second show, but no company has ever, with the exception of like, you know, when they did SmackDown. No company's ever done a successful second show. And SmackDown was not not the shit for a while. Like it was a, a very big drop in viewership compared to Monday Night Raw. It took them a while to build that brand up. So I don't want to see them do a second show, but I do want to see something compelling enough that makes me want to tune in and it makes me give a shit. And they have gone back to one match, a couple old school throwback matches. And then an interview that tells us nothing about a wrestler. I understand why why did they do the GM Miller interview the way that they do. It's not that far off from what Josh Matthews used to do. Because I don't think you should talk about 24-7 professional wrestling. I don't, I don't think that should be your only topic. Like, I don't think she should be like, where did you train? You know, I, that's not really what I want. I do enjoy the, uh, the candor of it and this, the... You know, it's very laid back. It's kind of like getting to know the wrestler behind the scenes a little bit. But I do think you have at some point you have to have even if it's one question at the end, you have to give us something that we can like sink our teeth into about their journey to TNA or, or, you know, something along those lines. Something that the fans actually want to know. Like it's cool to know all this other stuff, but there are stuff about these wrestlers that we want to know. And um it's it's absent of that. Uh, you know, she's she is close to asking them what is their third favorite dinosaur. Like that's how random the few interviews I've watched have been. But now we're getting back to the old explosion, the old explosion no one cared about in the United States, and they're they're going that direction again. They love their classic matches. And I've said before, there there's a reason. WWE is not reminding you about WrestleMania six and WrestleMania seven. And uh, what's the one they say is the best one ever is like 17 or 18. They're not talking about Royal rumble 93, like, because those were better. Those were better times. These, these matches look a hundred times better than what they're doing right now. The commentary hundred times better. Every, pretty much every aspect of it, the star power in it, it is. It was better. It was a better show. It was a bigger budget show. And you're just like constantly showing us what once was. And then you go to, you know, Rhino versus Shira wrestling in the dark. So people are starting to, to care less and less about this show when there was some uh, little bit of excitement. All you had to do was put two matches on it. All you had to do was keep two matches. And I think people would have tuned in. Now it's like, do I really want to pull this up on YouTube, fast forward through all this fucking muck just to get to the one match? You know, because I don't think the interviews are, are going to really do it either. So what do I know? What do I know? I know nothing. Let's get into impact. As I said, good episode. I thought last week's episode was the best one of the year. And this one is... I would say it's giving it a run for its money. I thought it was very good. It kicks off with the Rebellion referendum, which was a number one contenders match for the X Division Championship. So I like that they called it this because it just... Chris Jericho was talking on on his podcast one time that say they do like a contract signing or, you know, they would do like these... His... his, um, his factions would do promos in a ring and he would always call it something, you know, like a town hall meeting or, or whatever, but they very rarely just called it what it was because they wanted to make it sound special, sound different, even though it wasn't, it's all about the presentation. That's, um, that's kind of like what marketing is. It's like, Hey, here's the, there, here's what we want to promote, but how do we present it in a way that, um, that strikes up interest? 
So they, they, you know, this essentially was like a Mustafa, Mustafa, I cannot, I only know how to say Mustafa from Colonel Mustafa when I was a kid, Mustafa Ali, uh, basically like an invitational. However, it also sounded like he didn't know who was in the match. So this was Leon Slater. We got our, our first look at him. Chris Bay, Alan Angels, Jason Hotch, Kevin Knight, and Jake something. I didn't even know who the competitors were in this match before I knew who was going to win. Because at no, I believe it was no surrender. They had this random Jake something promo after he came off a loss, mind you. That he was gonna, you know, challenging himself. I mean, excuse me, that he was challenging the ex, the winner. That he's gonna be an X division champion. That he promised he would be the X division champion this year. It was really random at the time. Maybe, maybe for some fans, it was like, oh, it was just a promo. Like. For, uh, for those of us who analyzed the show a little more, it, we thought it was really random. So you just knew Jake something was going to win because who the fuck else have they built up to, to win this match? And had they removed that promo, uh, they'll just say it never happened. That's, that's more what I'm saying. Say that promo never happened. We really would have had no clue who was going to win this match. This would have been very unpredictable in my opinion. Because you have a couple stories here going on. You got the debut of Le- of Leon Slater. You've got the story of Jason Hacho, who's he just strictly there to make sure no one wins. But maybe he does win by accident. You got Kevin Knight, who was, you know, they took out, he was supposed to be injured, and you know, Ali was even like, What's he doing here? And then Jake something, which they told that. They didn't need the promo because when he showed up and Ali started talking about, whoa, whoa, what's this guy doing here? There has to be limits. He's three times their size. Now, now you're adding another wrinkle to this. But by the what once Ali said that, that was confirmation he was winning because Jake did the fucking promo. No one else did promos why they needed to win this thing. It was it was just just the one. All right. Just just the one singular motherfucker who has any kind of storyline involvement into this. So my whole point was go all in or do nothing. I would have rather heard from all these guys or heard from none of them because then you give us, you can give us a match where we really don't know who's going to win. This was a fucking great match. And I usually say every single time they have one of these matches, I'm not a big fan of these, you know, we got five, six people in the ring at the same time doing a bunch of pre-rehearsed spots. That's usually not the way I enjoy watching wrestling. But they did one at Snake Eyes that Jake won. He won the other one too, so uh, which was really good. I think Vikingo was in it and and Kushida. And, you know, this was a completely different field for the most part, I believe, except for um, Jake. Uh, and, you know, and the I guess the other small part of this was it was the Leon Slater debut. So... We know that historically people debut and then challenge for the title right away. So there was a chance he was going to win here too. And then you got Chris Bay, who's a you know former tag team champion, and wants to get you know a title back. So it was it was a great field. I just would have liked it to be a little bit more unpredictable rather than watching a great match waiting for Jake something to win. I thought Ali was excellent on commentary. He has he's oozing charisma. He's got all sorts of charisma. He's he's natural. And it was a breath of fresh air to two commentators who don't sound natural to me at all. They're not as bad as um, Matt Stryker and D'Lo were, where it was just the fakest fucking commentary in the world. you know. But it's not authentic. J- Tom Hannafin, for all the good he is on commentary and has all this knowledge about the history of TNA, like he is not authentic. That's That's the only real like knock I have on him. He does one thing that annoys me, though. I brought this up two weeks ago when I was reviewing the show and when I reviewed Sacrifice. Every single time someone kicks out of a pin, it's, and I'll kick out. I mean, it's, it's, those are strong words every single time. It is, it is 90% of the time or some variation of, and I'll kick out by Moose. He doesn't say two count, 
almost almost had him thought i thought he got him there oh we got a new champion like josh matthews every single time there's no variance to it. it's just and i'll cack out i know most of you don't give a shit about that stuff i have i have um explained that i get very annoyed easily like just the introvert in me goes very annoyed easily so um that's that gives you some insight why I, I point out some of the, the small details that I do. But again, this was an excellent match. Jake something wins. We knew that was going to happen. And that's what they're doing. So uh, Jake will be wrestling at Rebellion. Um, I got to scroll on the website. I had to watch the show at work, so I couldn't actually uh, take notes. There was the Dirty Dango segment, which was pretty good, pretty funny. And Oleg Prudius just walks off in the middle. He's like, he's no longer on the roster page. So they wrote him off TV by um, a minor dispute. And he just walks off the screen. And it's weird because this was like an edited segment. So uh, I don't know how to explain what I'm trying to say. It would, Him walking off would have made more set, sense if it came off like it was a a real-time segment, you know what I mean? But I did think it was funny. I thought the content to everything was very funny. I just want Dirty Dango to do something. There's this is there's nothing is is moving forward. But him telling Bravo to sit down every time he tried to get up, I thought was good. It was it was good. It was good. I, I really liked it. Backstage, Jim Miller running around and doing the WWE thing of oh, follow me. That that's that's what I'm talking about. So look, we're, we're going to pause here for a second. When I brought up at the beginning of the show, Eric Bischoff and, and these dudes, they, they are much like me where they just want to see, I'll, I'm not going to throw Cornette into that, into that. I'm going to say, um, Eric Bischoff, uh, uh, Vince Russo, and even someone who I'm a big fan of is Billy Corgan. Guys like this want to present wrestling different. Or they want to see someone attempt to present wrestling different. On Monday Night Raw recently, even if you don't watch Raw, I don't watch Raw, but it's been it was Raw or SmackDown. I don't really know, don't care. But it was going around on social media that they had that they have new camera angles. One of them being a singular camera that follow that recently followed like Miz or something through the hall all the way to where he needed to go. And um it the people popped for it online. If you don't know what I'm talking about, who cares? I, I you probably don't care. But I've been saying I've been saying like pretty much since I started podcasting was it was it was I've just been challenging TNA to present wrestling differently to just to to take a swing and just be like let me just do something no one else is doing that's why i enjoy nwa it's not as good as impact but billy corgan doesn't care what other people are doing like he he's like i'm going to take my own approach to what i envision pro wrestling is where tna there's too much i saw this on wwe i saw this on aw so i'm gonna do it all those fuckers, Alex Marvez, the, the fucking uh, the clowns backstage for WWE, Renee Paquette, they all do the, you know, walking around with the camera, follow me. <sighs> just 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 present wrestling differently. That just take just oh okay. Whoo. <sighs> breathing, breathing, breathing. All right. Anyway, Gia Miller backstage. Finds um AJ Francis and Rich Swan hanging out. Why is everyone always standing when you find them? Like I sit at every possible fucking opportunity, whether I'm at work or or in life. Like you're not going to catch me just standing on the wall. Anyway, AJ Francis and Rich Swan, something I'm very very invested in right now. Very invested in this. He did not let Rich Swan speak, which is good. I want to. I want. I want to feel. You know, in a company that really loves to rush things, I like to feel, 
you know, that I'm in anticipation of when Rich Swan finally speaks and cut his cuts his first promo because I want to hear what the hell he says, why he says it. I want to hear what his delivery is. You know, like he looks good like this. This he needed this. And when he put on AJ's Francis AJ Francis's glasses, like he needs glasses like that too. Like those looked great on him. Um, I'm really looking forward to. So next week, we're going to get into this a little bit. They've got a tag team name and everything. They'll get into it um, next week. But, you know, other than the goofy, like, follow me, you know. The reason it's so silly is because this is a place of work. Like, schedule the fucking interviews. Just be like, you know, why is she looking for them? Why why doesn't management say, hey, you have an interview with Gia Miller today on the show? It's it's because they see the shit. People do that shit on WWE. Then Diener is in the ring. He cuts a pretty long promo here. He's he's a good promo, but this wasn't like necessarily good at the same time. But I've got a little bit of intrigue. He is um they they, they very smartly got away from violent by design, the design. Uh, and there's there was there was points within those two groups where I was really interested. I was very interested in Diener when he initially became of became violent by design with Eric Young, and he just thought it looked like a badass. And he you know he just kind of had his head shaved, kind of like Eric Young. They just looked really good together as a team. And then with the design, I was open to him being the leader. I I love Alan Angels. Uh, you know I don't dislike Khan. So I was open to what that was going to be as well. And it wasn't good. And that they broke Allen Angels off, yet he still maintained that, he, you know, he still kept his heel status instead of like breaking off and becoming a baby face. Like it was just, it was pretty bad. I, I give him an A for effort, but it was, it overall, overall was pretty bad. Even though there were some good things that they did and some decent storylines, overall, we don't look fondly at the design. You know, when it's all said and done. So it looks like he's kind of going baby face. He's got the TNA t-shirt on. And C- Cody does um, public speaking, you know, as, as one of his, um, you know, off duty saying that from a law enforcement standpoint um, or terminology for, you know, on the, on the outside, one of his outside ventures, public speaking. Uh, speaking to kids and all that. So he's a likable guy. And I feel like they're somewhat trying to tap into that a little bit, you know, him being a man of the people. But I I have some interest. I mean, is he going to ask permission from the audience every time he does something? Is it going to carry over to the ring if he should hit his finisher, if he should tap out? (laughs) You know, so I don't know. I I have some intrigue. Um, I don't think they're going to go with as creative with it as, I'm I'm building up it in my head, building it up in my head. Like I'm already I'm being a total mark here, but I'm I'm fantasy booking in my head. Where where could they take this with Diener? It's probably not going to be any of that. He's probably just going to be they're probably just going to turn turn him into a white meat baby face or whatever. The grizzled young vets came out, and I've been saying many times that they did nothing for they do nothing for me. I really really liked this promo. I don't know. Who is who in this group? But uh, whoever was talking did an excellent job. Great on the mic. And the the segment by the time it was done was good. It was the Diener part was a little cringy, but by the time it was all said and done, it was pretty good. And then the time splitters come down. The time splitters take on the grizzled young vets and... I mean, who cares about the storyline at this point with Alex Shelley potentially turning heel and whatever the hell they're doing? Because he, they're not even going to be at Rebellion. They're probably not at the fucking Philadelphia tapings. Maybe they are. I don't know. But now I don't care about the storyline when I had some interest in it. But they had a very, very good tag team match and the time splitters. But Victoria. So at least, time, man, at least Kashida still has Kevin Knight around. Because if the guns are gone, you know, you cannot put Kashida out there as a solo wrestler because look what he, you know, wasn't it last year rebellion that he may have ended against Steve Macklin, you know, 
and it was flat as a plate of piss. So I, I don't think you can – I don't think he can be a singles guy unless he's in the X division. But thank God he's got Kevin Knight around if, if the guns are gone. But excellent tag team match. Very, very good. Tom Hannafin sat down with Hammerstone. This was also really good. I've never really heard this the dude speak before. But this was excellent. He gave us all the necessary backstory that we needed to care about what they did and what they're going to do. So um, I, I give this was very, very good. Of course, they had to play fucking music in the background. They cannot help themselves. Uh, I've said this many times. It takes away from the emotion of what's being said. The music wasn't that bad. I mean, it kind of tied into what he was saying for once. But, I mean, you just... You just remove all authentic authenticity when you put the music in the background. I think it's um, very detrimental to, seg- detrimental to the segment. Like if he if they did the same exact segment without it, I think we'd be looking at it even more fondly. But it's really kind of a small detail because the music wasn't that bad, but it was pretty good. And I'm very in- interested in um, you know when Hammer Hammerstone's going to do. The, uh, Tom Hannafin does that between the ropes or whatever the fuck, and this is exactly what it is. Um, it's it's more. Uh, I feel like it's in kayfabe now. I don't believe it was in kayfabe before, but it's that's exactly what it looks like and sounds like. It's that fucking format with the music and the highlights. So I'm kind of done watching those. I don't really care anymore. But that's if you know if you're not familiar with those segments, that's exactly what it was. Crazy Steve took on PCO. This was one of the low points of the night because we had to sit through the entire match. I, I love Crazy Steve's theme song. I love his entrance. It didn't hit as hard because PCO's entrance is kind of similar. But um, you know, Crazy Steve is saying he's going to defend the title every time. So he's not doing non-title matches. He's not doing tag team matches, you know, because a, a lot of at sacrifice, a lot of the champions were in tag team matches, which I've been asking for. Don't get me wrong, but you know they're using that for Crazy Steve to basically come off like I'm the most fightingest champion. So we sat through this, and then Big Con came out. I'm gonna tell you exactly where the fuck this is going. This is gonna be a three way match. At Rebellion, hopefully on the undercard, it's going to be a three-way fucking no disqualification, street fight, monsters ball, play with their fucking dicks match. I know the PCO and Con have a match here coming up, monsters ball, but Crazy Steve will probably get involved. I don't. I don't even know. I don't know spoilers. I have a hard time envisioning that this is not a three-way at Rebellion, though. This is the gift that keeps on giving. No one is asking for this with Khan and PCO. I, If Khan would have just beat PCO, I think you could have established him as a monster. But instead, it it wasn't even 50-50 booking. They... Khan has technically lost both matches. He was disqualified the first time. He lost. And even if he wins this Monsters Ball, who cares? He already lost. And then Decay is backstage on the stairs. At least there's no pink and purple lights behind them. And they're talking about um, wrestling Spitfire for the titles. And guess who just so happens to come around the corner is MK Ultra, and they're both arguing over who should be the rightful contenders. Normally, I would say that this is a three-way match, also a rebellion, but we know Killer Kelly is not going to be around for a bit. So, uh, most likely, it's some kind of number one contenders match that Decay wins, and then they're going to wrestle Spitfire. And um, I would be shocked if they won the titles right back. Like, you cannot hot potato it that fucking much. But Decay is so much better than those other two. So I don't know. But um, I will give Spitfire some props. They did that jobber match last week that I left pretty impressed with. I thought I actually thought they were a pretty good team. They they very well could elevate to a very legitimate tag team. So I'm not I'm not totally totally shitting on them. 
And as I said, I couldn't take notes as I worked. Some, Rosemary said something that I wanted to, to repeat. Oh, <laughs> I know what it was. It sounded so goofy in her character saying contractually obligated rematch. Like, did Tom Hannafin write this promo? And I kick out. All right, Eric Young, um, also very good. Came out top of the ramp. This was quick and painless. But he uh, challenged Frankie Gazarian at Rebellion to Full Metal Mayhem. Even though Full Metal Mayhem is a garbage match, it is a garbage match that I have liked every single time. So um, looking forward to this one at Rebellion. And Ash by Elegance uh, comes out. She has her third match versus Silesia Sparks, who I like a lot, actually. I follow her on um, on Twitter. So uh, she was someone, they brought her in before. I was like, man, um, you know, I would keep her around. A lot of these women they bring in for these jobber matches, like they look, I've oh, you guys have heard me say I had more interest in them than the opponent. Um, I, I would keep her around, but I don't think that they will. Because instead, they're going to have a division with nobody in it. So uh, Ash wins this one. Obviously, there was a spot where Ash was supposed to do a handspring moonsault, and she did it directly onto her legs because she was anticipating uh, Silesia Sparks getting the knees up. That looked really bad. But other than that, you know, I really think her swanton is is a. Uh, is good. It came out of nowhere the first time she did it. She used to have that same fucking finisher that Mike Bennett used at Miracle in Progress, and a couple people have used it. I hate that finisher. I hate it. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm really glad that she she busts this out uh, when she calls a rarefied error. I tell you, this company comes up with these finisher names sometimes that um, I don't I don't understand what they're saying. Like, I only know it's rarefied air because I'm staring at the words. But, like, when they say it, I'm like, what did he say? You know, the same with you know, Deon- Deanna Perrazzo, Venus de Milo, or whatever the hell. Like, I-, I couldn't tell you how to spell that. Giselle Shaw with whatever the hell she calls that thing. Like, all these, I don't know. But, but at least it's not just the swanton, you know. I always say, where's the cool names? But I also want names that I can remember and, and pronounce. So um, after this, sorry, I'm scrolling. We hear from Nick Nemeth. He's got a great theme song. I, I talked about this last week. This would, the, Josh Alexander needs something like this. The people go crazy for it. You need, you need something like that for your top guy. Instead of dark ominous tones something like this. So Nick Nemeth came out and said that, Hey, I was going to earn my TNA title match. The first person to step up with Steve Macklin. Guess what? He was the only person to step up because now you are giving your, your title match. So I've, I've, I've compared it to other people in the past that have come here and say, Hey, I'm going to work my way to the top, which usually means give me one or two opponents and then I'm going to wrestle for the title. So we've we have known since this motherfucker showed his face in TNA that he was going to wrestle for the the title at at Rebellion. Like we have we have known this. There's no there's no secrets. I learned something about Nick Nemeth very interesting the other day. I guess he says it at nauseum, but I've just never heard him say it. But he doesn't watch wrestling, and that kind of gave me some insight as to why he ended up in TNA. Like he doesn't. I remember Jeff Hardy years ago had said when, you know, this was back when they're on pop TV that he was, he was clueless how many people watched TNA. I could tell by his um, verbiage that he thought a lot more people watch it than, than really did, but he had no clue. And I feel like Nick Nemeth maybe has no clue how many people watch the respective companies. So Maybe that's a good thing because he doesn't care. He's just like, oh, yeah, I'll go do TNA. I'll go be the guy over there. For all he knows, just as many people watch it as AEW. <laughs> you know, so uh, probably a good thing. But, you know, hopefully this is a good match at the pay-per-view. I, th- I think it will be. I think these are two guys with like a, a show-stealing type of mindset, which I think is is great for your main event. You know, I don't think you have that. I don't think you should necessarily have that um, way of thinking in the undercard like AEW will do. But 
Um, I think that I think they're going to put on a, a pretty good match. And then, of course, the kiss the system comes down. They're looking like stars. Eddie Edwards has needed this so fucking badly. Oh my god! You know they they with the suits and everything, great, just a great touch. They look like stars. The system is great. You know they got the championships. They look so good. Alicia had her pantsuit going. I mean, this is just it's a great, great faction. Next week, we're getting the return of the 841 match, which I think is a fucking horrible name, but it's a great format uh, for the next challenger for the Knockouts World Championship. Uh, we're getting AJ Francis and Rich Swan, um, you know, explaining their actions. Josh Alexander will be in action. I don't know what that means. A wrestling PCO. It's going to be a surprise opponent. It's going to be PCO. I'm totally kidding. Main event of this program was the Knockouts World Champion, Jordan Grace versus Tasha Steeles. We knew that Jordan and Grace was going to win this thing. There's, this is no, you know. Tom Hannafin had said on commentary that Tasha Steeles has never beat her. Guess what? She still has never beat her. So I don't know if, if um, you know, when it's all said and done and Jordan leaves this company to go to WWE, if Tasha Steeles is going to be the one to beat her. I don't know, but they had a they had a good match here. I really enjoyed their their three way with um, Zaya Brookside. Speaking of Zaya Brookside, I, I completely fast forwarded past the fact. So like I said, I don't have notes today that she um, she came out at the end of the um, Ashby Elegance match. So obviously they're going to work together pretty soon. I don't think it's a pay per view match. I think it should be, but I think it's. Um, I think it's at Philadelphia. So we'll see what they have Ash doing. I yeah, we'll talk about we'll talk about things further next week when it when there's a number one contender. But um but yeah, with this match here, this this was just a match for the sake of having Jordan Grace on TV. The the current knockouts division, these girls are just taking losses left and right to Jordan. Uh there's there's absolutely no one to challenge her at this point. So now we're like, hey, you gotta bring outsiders in that were at that point so but yeah great match great um great main event it's always good to see the knockouts in the main event and you know they always deliver they always deliver and this this match was no different and um then impact went off the air so again this was another like pretty pretty solid episode and you know it, it i mean it's rare that they do bad television you know for the most part the most part of the television is pretty good with with this company. You know, there's certain um, there's certain aspects of it. You notice I didn't talk about the production value for once in my life, so I'm going to continue not to. Uh, but there's you know there's aspects of that. But as I, I said earlier in the show, like just just present wrestling different. That's that's really what I what I want to see happen. That's why Lucha Underground once upon a time was so talked about and so popular. Because it was different. They weren't trying to copy anything that anybody else was doing. So I just want to see more of that when I'm watching this show. That's going to do it for me, folks. I am your boy, BQ. Thanks for hanging out with me. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.